Now, Kath and I have been away for five weeks. I'm never going to take her away with me again overseas. <laughs> Do you believe me? The truth is, we're going to Brazil in two weeks' time for the World Pentecostal Conference. This is in my role as CRC head of the movement. We're part of the World Pentecostal Conference, and so we've already booked and paid for it. So let's pray for healing today that she can travel with me, okay? So uh, hey, it's been great to be overseas, but uh, I just did a little tweet while Laura was leading us in songs. I just said, there's nothing like being home. In your home church, with your home team, leading us in worship under great difficulties, but who cares, eh? Let's do it next week as well. Let's bring back the songbooks, eh? And <laughs> um, but uh, we did have a great time in, in Greece and in Israel and in Ghana, and for those who are not aware, Kathy had a little accident in Ghana and busted up her shoulder pretty badly. And uh, the, uh, uh, the doctors here have said it's worse than what we thought, so she might need a little bit of surgery. So at the moment, there's lots of pills and lots of prayer, and uh, we're believing for a miracle, even today. Yes. And uh, that God will, will touch her and uh, make her well. Could have been a lot worse. We're very thankful. The slip in the bathroom, she could have smashed her head on the bathtub, and uh, she could have been in the literal presence of the Lord. So, um, so we're thankful, and uh, we're just trusting the Lord. And, and we, uh, we don't focus on what we don't have, we focus on what we do have, don't we? And we're thankful for every day, enjoying every moment and uh, experiencing God and enjoying every day to the full because they're gifts from the Lord. So when you have an accident, you realise that more than everything. Okay, yeah, this is the day the Lord has made. I'm going to rejoice in it and I'm going to think positively and I'm going to use it to the max to bring him glory and to add value to as many people's lives as possible. And uh, so we've been doing a series here on, uh, uh, as we've said, towards belief. And um, Carl Fazer's material is brilliant. In fact, I, I looked at the one on the supernatural that you'll be doing in uh, small groups or some of you in connect groups if you choose that one. And it's fantastic. Um, uh, just the, the way that he's able to share about belief in the supernatural, how normal and rational it is, using Oxford professors who are brilliant people and who are also men and women of faith. And uh, I, I was thrilled to watch uh, Cass and Tim. Um, and you can go anywhere around the world, and if you've got an iPhone, you press a little button, if I can do it, and they come on. So you don't have to miss church at all. If you miss a Sunday service, Make sure you, you've got our app and you can hear the messages. So the messages on suffering and sexuality were fantastic. Now, I'm focusing on the supernatural. Do you know, and I want to make time, I can't see the clock here, so oh, that's great, I can go for however long I want. <laughs> you don't know, okay, you know, you've got clocks on. Um, but there's a huge amount of criticism today, more than ever, against the supernatural, against the miraculous. Um, and it's, uh, you know, like, I guess the two avenues by which it's, it's becoming stronger is would be through the media and through our university sectors. And, and uh, I mean, I love the media. I, 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 there's some marvellous journalists and, and interviewers, people that are just terrific, and they've got a Christian faith. Well, some of them are not Christians, but they're really honest and upfront and and they don't have their own agenda. But at the same time, there's no question that the anti-supernaturalists, the atheists who are militant, not those who are open to discussion, are kind of using the media to, to downplay anyone who has a religious faith, no matter what it is, but particularly against Christians. And at the university sector, uh, Kathy is a, a teacher at Flinders Uni and uh, teaches nurses. And I've been to, I went to Flinders Uni and did an arts degree and sub-majored in biology. And, and we had a wonderful time there. There were people who had beliefs that they weren't Christians or they were atheists. And, and we would have discussions and debate. But it was really good based on evidence, on the facts. And say, oh, yeah, let's think about that one. And, and it was open discussion, a place of learning, a place of big ideas, debating, discussion. Now, censorship has come in, and if you have a particular viewpoint, you're downgraded, you are almost victimized, and it's almost like a shutdown. Don't discuss these things. 
Um, and so it, it's pretty ugly, and you may, if you're at university, have experienced that. And it's certainly got worse in the last four decades since, since uh, I went to uni. Um, so the anti-supernatural critics will say things like this. Miracle stories in the Bible are just quaint ways of conveying religious truth. They're not meant to be taken literally. Now, these are the good guys. They're not. They're, they're kind of, oh, Yay. oh. <laughs> Miracles do happen. Oh. See, I prayed. It wasn't the guys working up there. I'm praying. Work in Jesus' name. I just didn't tell you I was doing that. So th these are the nice guys. They say miracle stories in the Bible are just quaint ways of conveying religious truth. They're not meant to be taken literally. I mean, you know, like we're growing ups now. You know, we don't, we don't take those things literally. They're just mythologic, just stories that people have added to, to certain facts about Jesus and the other characters in the Bible. So they might say things like, in a sarcastic manner, you know, do you really, do you really believe that Jonah was swallowed by a big fish? You don't seriously think that Christ actually fed 5,000 people from five loaves of bread and two fishes, do you? So it's like they've already made it in their mind. And so when I say, well, actually, I do. And if they're a friend and they know me that I'm a rational, intelligent, well-educated human being, they get a bit, no, Bill, you don't. I say, yeah, I do. I actually do. And it opens up some good discussions, particularly if you're a credible person and you've got meaningful relationships with people, and there's a, a love-respect relationship, don't be frightened to actually share your personal belief that God is a supernatural God, a miraculous God, that we believe in a God who, who can do miracles. Um, so, so how do we answer this? Okay. Their issue is generally not with a particular miracle, but with the whole notion of supernatural miracles. The underlying issue stems from their view of God, actually. So the real problem is not with miracles, but with the entire concept of God. Their initial premise or their inner belief affects their attitude. The underlying belief system that they have kind of colours their perspective. So they've got these glasses on, and irrespective of evidence, they say, no, we cannot believe in miracles because basically they don't believe that there is a personal God. So once we assume the possibility of God's existence, there's no problem with miracles. For what is more reasonable than God transcending natural law of which he is the author? But if you remove the very possibility of God's existence, then the concept of miracles is impossible to entertain. And so many anti-supernaturalists, we'll call them, hold views often so strongly that they refuse even to consider any evidence of a miracle having occurred. They emphatically assert that miracles do not, have not, and never will happen. Any evidence of the contrary is presupposed to be either false or misconstrued. And yet those critics can only say, really, if they're honest, that they have not themselves witnessed a miracle. So here's an important question. Why should critics' testimony outweigh that of a person who has witnessed a miracle? The only way to prove that a miracle has never happened would be to prove that every person who has ever claimed to have experienced or observed a miracle was a liar. And I am not a liar. I don't lie. I don't deliberately lie. And if I do tell a half-truth or an exaggeration, I, I try to say, oh, well, actually, let me just rephrase that if I'm talking to somebody. I didn't quite say that accurately. So that's what they come down to. Say, you're either lying or you're crazy. And they look at me and they realise I'm eminently sane. <laughs> <laughs> so when you see this... Um, the DVD series of, of Carl Face, the one on the supernatural, he has a testimony, like he's got Oxford Dons and people from Princeton, yeah, whatever, sharing, and he's got this doctor, medical doctor, I think he's a specialist doctor, Indian chap, he's 39 years of age, he's driving across the Nullarbor, going home, I think it's to, to, to um, uh, Kalgoorlie where he's practicing, gets chest pains, and pretty soon he realises, hmm, something's not quite right. By the time he goes into a clinic, just a town before Kalgoorlie or somewhere there near where his wife was, he's having a full-on heart attack. They take him in 
and he dies. Doctors come in, they're working on him, doing all the stuff, all the technology, and so 20 minutes later, he's pronounced dead. He's white, he's got no pulse. His wife comes in, I think she may be a doctor as well, and, and, and he says it so beautifully, and everyone's kind of given up, and she just comes in, and she just falls on her knees and just lays hands on him and just cries out to God and says, God, he's only 39. I'm 37, we've got two kids. You know, I need him. God have mercy. The guy comes back to life. He comes back to life and he, he testifies and says, I was clinically dead. I've checked out the actual results of what the machines were saying. But of course, somebody who does not believe that God exists, they will find a, an explanation devoid of God and say it's not a miracle. And so he's saying it is a miracle and he is a scientist, he is a medical man. So, have a look at that. It's actually a, a really inspiring story, one that you can safely give to some friends who are questioning. I have seen so many interventions of God that I find it hard to believe that, that a rational human being does not believe that there is a personal God who exists. I'm at the moment doing a, a lot of reading on physics, astrophysics and stuff, because I'm quite ignorant about physics. I, I hated physics and chemistry. I love biology and history. And uh, the more I delve into the realm of creation and what astrophysicists are finding, I just think, how the heck can you look at that and observe that and not say there is a God? If you want to talk to somebody who really knows about it, talk to, to Tom. Um, oh, brainy Tom. Tom Daly? Tom Daly, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tom Daly Sr., you hear Tom? Okay, I'm giving, he, he knows all about it. So we've had a couple of discussions, and I must admit, I, I, I pretend to say, yeah, that's, yes, I understand. I'm going with that. I, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> but it's a fantastic realm. There's some of the, the physicists out there who are researching, that, wow, this has to be God at work. And so in my own personal journey, I've seen the Lord do so many things in my own life, through my through my own prayers and faith, and also in the life of the Christian Family Centre. Uh, so many miracles. Um, one of the, what, and I think the hardest thing for God to do, really, the hardest thing for God is to change a human heart. Have to be. In the sense that, that you know, like if you had a, a whole pile of dead people here and a whole pile of living people, it's much harder for God to change their hearts than to raise the, than to raise the dead because the dead put up no resistance. <laughs> They're not going to say, oh, well, you brought me back to life, I want to die again. No, no, no. Living people, they put up resistance. They've got memories, they've got volition, will, they've got my, you know, the mindsets and attitudes and a whole pile of barriers. And for God to break through human life and to change its orientation where it's going that way and then it's going that way, to me, takes more of his power and grace than to raise a dead body to life. In fact, the conversion of a human heart, in fact, I hate even talking, using the word conversion because it almost in, implies um, sort of the person doesn't choose or it's like forced. It, it, it's actually when God starts to move upon a human heart, he never violates their will. He always leads them to them to, them to make a decision and gradually people come to faith. Some people suddenly, for me, it was six months where I came to faith, and, and, uh, but I've seen too many massive conversions and know the kind of people they were to say, that's impossible. You can't re-educate the human heart. You can't reform the human heart. You can't counsel that person to be good. It requires the direct power of God to change the very nature of the person where selfishness reigns and now selflessness reigns. One of the, the earliest ones was, I'm only 22 years of age and I'm leading a revival in a school, and I've got a photo of this guy up here. I'll put him up for our 40th anniversary. Have we got the photo of Neville? There he is. And there I am there. How's those sideburns, eh? 18 years of age, skinny as a rake. Used to run around the shower to get wet. It was like just, just very hard. So we're leading a revival in a school, and we've got dozens of these young people who we have to teach the things of God. So we're doing teaching on a Monday night and a Saturday most of the day. So we're at this house doing a teaching 
and we're having a lunch break, and one of the girls goes to the park across the road, and she sees this guy, Neville, and uh, he's just there on his own, and she starts talking to him. Well, then she invites him to come to the study, the, it's only a Bible study. He's a pagan. He's not, not a Christian at all. And so I'm thinking, well, why is he there? Is he there to check the girl out? Because she was a good-looking girl. And um, so I thought, oh, maybe, you know, beast of the honey, maybe he's kind of <laughs> checking around. So I'm, I'm keeping an eye on him just to make sure he's not after one of our beautiful girls. And um, so he's just sitting there, listening to the whole day. So he, he doesn't say much. You know, we have a meal together. And then we go to a youth meeting that night. He comes with us. Then after the youth meeting, we go to what we call a tape night. The tape night was before VCRs came. <laughs> this is big tapes. And they would send them from America, top speakers, and we'd go to someone's home. It starts at 9.30 at night, 10 o'clock, and we'd listen to about 12 o'clock to two or three speakers. So that's how far back it was. So he's there, listening to all this stuff too. So we've got him in the back of the, our old FJ, so Dante and myself, and we just kind of, I turned to him and said, what do you think, Nev? <laughs> like, you know, like, You've been hanging around us for nearly 24 hours. And he just bursts out, I want to accept Jesus. I, I, I need Jesus. So we led him to Christ right there in the FJ, back seat. Next, next, next morning, we picked him up for church. We had two church services. Then in the afternoon, we had planned at the end of Henley Beach Road, right at the end of Henley Beach Road, the middle of winter, a baptism service. And we baptized about 30 young people. And so, so never wanted to come. I want to be at the baptism. You just want to come and see. So we're baptizing these kids, and of course we prepare them. We say, girls, no bikinis, fellas wear long dacks, you know, just 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 decency and order. So before we knew it, Neville strips off to this. <laughs> they're not bathers, they're his undies. And then we said, okay, straighten the water. So we had to go into the water to, to cover him up, you know. And <laughs> so so we talked to him. So we talked to him. And we baptised him. Now, this is Saturday afternoon we met him. Saturday night he accepts Christ. Sunday afternoon he gets baptised. I think Sunday night we went to church again. Three times a Sunday. That's the normal Christian life back then in the early 70s. And then Monday night we had uh, what we call a, uh, another Bible study. I forget. And so he, he's, he's wanted to come to that. So we're, we're having a worship time. And we're all sitting around a big lounge room, just sitting with our backs to the wall, just worshipping, someone's playing the guitar. It's a beautiful time. And then all of a sudden, he goes stiff as a board and just go, slides, zip, boom. And we heard the crash, bang. Oh, what's that? And then we see him start to shake. And then we start seeing him breathe heavily. Oh, what's happening here? And then he starts bellowing and contortions on his face and we didn't know what was going on we'd never cast out an evil spirit from somebody before we're kind of looking on so we all go oh the guitar went a bit louder and uh, <laughs> everyone's like this you know so we just we're only young people so we lay hands on him and then it just screamed out of him like just tore him and shaking just like in bible day and then you know, contortions on him at the face as he just exhales then he like there's no breath. I'm thinking, what's happening? And then he inhales. And this beautiful smile comes on his face. And he just starts lifting his hands and starts speaking in a brand new prayer language. He'd never he received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. An evil spirit got expelled and the Holy Spirit comes in him and he gets filled with the Spirit. This guy's still walking with Jesus today. And to me, that spoke to me of what God can do miraculously to change the life, the spirit, the heart of a human being. And I experienced that. And I know so many of you have experienced a personal God who turns up and speaks into our soul and heals our soul, saves us, forgives us, guilt's removed, shame is removed, a relationship with him. And so when people say, when I say to them, you know, I talk with God, he's a friend, they think, that's language that is inconceivable. So we try to talk with him every day. Because really 20 minutes pass when I'm not shooting up a prayer to God. And, and does he answer? Yeah, yeah, sometimes he answers. Not all the time. So some of my prayers are selfish and he won't answer those. But, um, but he hears them all. And I said, he's sovereign, he's good. He answers my prayers and I trust him with my very life. And that was an example, even though it happened 42 or so, three years ago. And I've seen that 
occur hundreds, in fact thousands of times in people's lives over the years. And I know you have as well. And the Christian Family Centre story. Uh, Nathan Betcher and uh, Leslie Turner and I have talked about there are so many miracles, there are so many stories that maybe um, if I'm still around, uh, this is my 38th year leading the church, if, in, for the 40th, maybe I'll write up the story and we'll start doing it. Write up the story and actually list all the miracles and all the amazing guidance and supernatural dreams and visions and provisions and miracles. This church would not exist if we didn't have a miracle working God. If you read the book of Acts and you take miracles out of the book of Acts, you, t you look at the Gospels, you take the Gospels and the book of Acts and take miracles and the supernatural out, it's just a dead, dry book. It's just nothing. The Christian Family Centre without God is just a social club. But it's a spiritual organism where God is at work, changing lives and providing, and, and many of us have seen him. So maybe that book will come out. Pray that it will happen, that I'll find the time to do it. Do you know, C.S. Lewis said this about miracles. All the essentials of Hinduism would, I think, remain unimpaired if you subtracted the miraculous. And the same is almost true of Mohammedism. He called it that. It's actually Islam. But you cannot do that with Christianity. It is precisely the story of a great miracle. A naturalistic Christianity, anti-supernaturalist, leaves out all that is especially Christian. You can't divorce the supernatural from Christianity. Uh, the, 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 who Jesus is, fully God and fully man, eternal son, becomes Jesus of Nazareth, and uh, dies, rises again, sends the Holy Spirit, and now there's, there's, it's the largest and most influential living organisation on planet Earth. Governments, nations come and go, empires come and go, but the Church of Jesus Christ has been around for 2,000 years and it's getting stronger and stronger and stronger. Why I go to Africa every year, and uh, in spite of the unpleasantness of the accident, and Kathy missed the conference, and um, I was able to get to most of it and, and as well as looking after her, I went to this conference uh, called... Um, uh, it was called Iron Sharpens Iron, ISI, but they had to change it because on the web page it got confused with ISIS. <laughs> so the, the conference now is called Give Yourself Holy to God. And 12,000 pastors from the, uh, the, the, the West African nations, whole polar nations that are all French speaking. A couple of them are English speaking, most of them are French speaking nations. And um, so uh, Bishop Dag Hewitt Mills gets them together once a year there. He's now running ISI in several places around the world. And uh, Bishop Dag um, came here in 2010. He was a university student in his final year of doing medicine. And God saved him, half Swiss, half Ghanaian. And uh, he um, fell in love with this young woman called Adelaide. So he wants to bring her here to see the, the city that was named after her, he says. And, um, and so he got saved and started leading people to Christ. Now, since 1988, there are 2,600 churches that have been planted in about 80 nations across the world. It's probably one of the fastest, if not the fastest growing Christian denomination in the world today. That and the Redeemer Church in Nigeria. And they have a heart for the West. They, they, they want to convert the pagan West. They say the gospel came to us, we're now taking the gospel back to you. They've got 200 churches in the UK alone. Uh, uh, this is Lighthouse International Church. Lighthouse Chaplains National. And, um, and so they've got a hospital by their major facility. I think in, in uh, Accra, it would have to be one of the largest churches in the world because the, um, the, uh, I, I, I minister in the cathedral churches and I would think the main church would have around 10,000 people and then the cathedral church is probably 1,000 to 1,500. Then each cathedral church has about 50 churches under it. So I reckon there could be 75 to 100,000 people who are now part of Lighthouse, just in Accra, a city of, of 5 million people, the size of Sydney. So it's a massive move of God at what's taken place. One of the things that God spoke to Dag about was to take the gospel to the rural areas of West Africa. He goes, evangelists from the UK or from America, come to the big city where it's easy, get a stadium. And he felt, what about the poor? What about the poor Muslims? What about the rural people out in Guinea and Togo and and uh, Bokasso, Faso, and, and Niger, and all those places. So they've, they've created this ministry called uh, Healing Jesus Campaigns. 
and they go into the rural areas. Their trucks, they might have a dozen semi-trailers, will take a week to go to a particular area. So what they then do is his hospital, the, the doctors and nurses come and they do uh, medical service. So the morning, 8 o'clock through to, to 4 or so, they would treat thousands of people. And some of the, the people that are really unwell, particularly young girls and young women, and they focus on uh, gynecological kind of stuff because the head of the hospital is an obstetrician, so they bring these people in for surgery. And uh, free of charge, 40-bed hospital, they get the top doctors from, from Ghana to actually Accra to come in and do surgery in, in 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning. So they do that during the day, and then DAG teaches the pastors, then at night they run the Healing Jesus campaigns. This is probably the largest evangelistic ministry in the world today. They have led 10 million people to Christ. Their goal now is 100 million people to come to Christ. They can't follow up the Muslim converts because they work with the Muslim communities and they come in and say, we're going to talk about Jesus and who he is and how he can heal, but they don't actually then say, you must join a church, except that those obviously uh, who want to will go to a local church. And also there's lots of areas where they go where there's not Muslims and they uh, come to Christ. I want to show you a clip of some of the healing. He wants me to come there to one of the healing. I'm on the board of this healing. That's why I go there every year. We have a board meeting for half a day and there's about 60 of us from around the world that are on his board. And, and we support the Healing Jesus campaigns. I'd love us to be able to give more. We give about $5,000 a year. I'd love us to be able to give $10,000 uh, or even more. But I want you to watch this and then to see as he's preaching in some of these campaigns where on the left there's a whole pile of people that get healed without, before he even starts praying for them. We're talking about people who are deaf, blind, crippled. And there's all this commotion that disrupt them. And then, and then they testify. They've got all their doctors there to verify that these are genuine healings. And if they can't be verified, then they make sure they don't publicise it to a later. So they're very conservative in this way. So have a look at Bishop Dag Hewitt Mills in action. But um, I show that to you because the thing that stands out with particularly African people, Melanesian people, is their openness to receive all that God has to offer. They don't allow, and I, I've thought this one through carefully, why in the West do we struggle with this compared to the East and to African Melanesia? I think it's because we're so addicted to the classical Greek kind of modern educational rationalistic model where everything has to be empirically verified and we naturally fear and doubt Whereas in the East and in other nations, they intuitively, and I think our indigenous people, like they intuitively kind of feel God and are become lightning rods for his presence and power and peace, that they just abandon themselves. And when you see that, you realise, you know what, uh, they're giving God permission. And, uh, and as Jesus said to, to many people, he would say to them, look, just believe, because don't doubt, because grab your doubt, put it aside, Nothing wrong with having honest doubts and questioning, but, but don't let that doubt restrict you operating from your spirit of faith. Or he says to another man, he goes, look, just believe, don't fear. And the poor dad cries out over a little boy that was bound by demonic power and, and the disciples couldn't drive out this evil spirit. And, and the, the father cries out, Jesus, help my unbelief. He goes, I believe, but help my unbelief. He wants us to be honest. If we're struggling with unbelief and doubt and fear and anxiety, it's not a matter of saying, well, let's hide that. Bring it before him, but don't let those things restrict you from allowing the God of all grace to do his thing in us and among us and through us. That's why I love going to Africa, because it renews me and helps me to minister more effectively in this Western world where we kind of put so many restrictions because of this rationalistic attack. And I believe in being rational and having being evidence-based, but not letting that become God. Not deifying rational thought, but letting God be God. There's only one deity. And we need to become lightning rods for the expression of trust and faith in him. And so we're going to look to God right now. I'd like you to stand.